Lifting Up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Good morning, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. Wonderful to be with you again this morning. Yesterday I was most impressed. I was able to speak about things like nucleotides and ribosomes and endoplasmic reticulums, and everybody knew what I was talking about. <laughs> But today, it seems that while people are quite happy with talking about transfer RNA and they're quite happy talking about mitotic cell division, people don't know what hermeneutics is, <laughs> or so I've been told. Hermeneutics is not precisely biblical interpretation, but how you do it and what happens when you do it. Biblical interpretation, how you do it, what happens when you do it. Yesterday, we looked at the demise of liberal higher criticism, of higher criticism. We looked at how it came from the incipient influences of Darwinism and of Hegelian philosophy, which went hand in hand. The things to which this Hegelian and Darwinian worldview gave rise. Everything from Marxism to Third Reich to, in fact, higher criticism. But now with the erosion of the philosophical and scientific basis of the Darwinian worldview, they're in crisis. Evolutionists are no longer Darwinians, they are neo-Darwinians. They even admit they have problems, that's why they write silly books like Climbing Mount Improbable. With the worldview dissipating, so too the higher critical theology that has no market for its product because it holds the form of religion but denies the power therein is collapsing. These will not be the issues of tomorrow. 25 years ago, when I was in university in the 1970s and so on, they were the issues. Secular humanism was the issue. Atheism was the issue. A particular kind of man-exalting rationalism was the issue, all of it coming from Darwinism. That was very much a post-Christian world. But as I concluded yesterday, the coming world is no longer a post-Christian one. That was 25 years ago. Now it is a neo-pagan one. The future challenges to the church and to Christian belief will not be what came from Darwinism. It'll be from a new kind of neo-Darwinism where science and the occult begin to reintegrate. With the Enlightenment, they separated. Astronomy went one way, astrology the other, etc. as we pointed out yesterday. Alchemy went one way, while physics and chemistry the other. Now we're seeing a reintegration. This will continue. You will find a mystical interpretation of neo-Darwinism beginning to emerge from this and of course it will come into play in biogenetic engineering. Nonetheless, let's continue looking at the new challenge of what the new threat will be for the future. The new threat will come in two forms. That which will undermine biblical orthodoxy is happening in two forms. One is the ecumenical movement, but the other is neo-Gnosticism. Neo-Gnosticism. Let's begin by understanding Gnosticism from the Greek word Gnosos, a subjective mystical revelation. We see a tremendous rebirth of Gnosticism in the current world. The growth of Hinduism, Eastern religion coming to the West. When I was a teenager, the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi came to Bangor, Wales, gave a series of lectures attended by the pop icons of my generation, such as the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and so on. And at that point, if I was to put my finger on any one event, the New Age movement was born. People in the West have since been looking to Eastern religions. As I always point out, I wish they could come with me one time to India and look at the effect that those religions have had on India. But they don't think that way. We have a neo-Gnosticism. What is this new mysticism? In Hinduism, it's the guru. He's the source of revelation. Not the gods, Rama, Sitra, Shitra, those are demons anyway. 
but you look to the guru or to the Brahmin priest. In Hasidic Judaism, mystical Judaism based on Kabbalah, it's not what the Torah says, the Pentateuch. It's what the Rebbe or the Tzaddik says. They claim he has the reincarnated spirit of Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement. It's not what the Torah says, it's what the Rebbe says about it. He has the mystical revelation. If you don't see it, you're not in tune with God. Okay. Mormonism, it's their revelator in Salt Lake City. You're going to have a new revelation. The key to God is going through that man. Okay. Jehovah's Witnesses were strongly built on Gnosticism. The ideas of Charles Tazzy Russell and Judge Rutherford, purely Gnostic. Purely Gnostic. We also see it in Islam, Sufi Islam and Shia Islam. It's what the Imam says, not what the Koran says. It's what the Imam says about the Koran. In Roman Catholicism, the form of Gnosticism is known as the sensus plenior, sensus plenior in Latin, the fuller sense. But because the Pope is the heir of Peter, he becomes infallible when he speaks ex cathedra from the chair of Peter. He cannot make a mistake, they believe, in all matters of doctrine. It's not what the scripture says that's important, it's what the pontiff says about the scripture. Although Mary says in the Magnificat, my soul rejoices in God my Savior, Mary can say she needs to be saved. The Pope can say, no, no, Mary had no sin, Immaculate Conception. It's not important what the Bible said or even what Mary said. It's only important what the Gnostic said about it. And of course, if you don't agree with the Gnostic, you're under deception. Now, this has begun to invade Certainly Protestantism, but even the evangelical church, particularly my fellow charismatic and Pentecostals are increasingly being deluded by this new Gnosticism. In the early church, there were two forms of Gnosticism. And again, if you understand the real origins of evolution, it is not Darwin or even Lamarck. It goes back to ancient Near Eastern and Oriental Gnosticism. There were evolution myths in the ancient Orient. The real root of Gnosticism. In the early church, you had two forms. You had the purely pagan forms. These began to make inroads into Judaism, particularly in the city of Alexandria in Egypt, at that time a Greek city. But then there were the pagan forms that were only pagan. They had demiurges and eons and things like this. But then there were the forms that got into the church, championed by people like Oregon, Basilides, Valentinus, well, today it's the same. We have two forms of Gnosticism. The purely pagan form of Gnosticism is the New Age movement, neo-mysticism. What is this Gnosticism, this revelation? They call it the cosmic illumination of the inner self. What is the form getting into the church? We'll look. But let's go to the beginning. Let's look at how the first Christians, who were Jewish, interpreted the Bible. This is the first difference. One, there was wordplay, wordplay. Now, some of our own people who listen to our tapes are familiar with these things. If you were to look at the nativity narrative of Matthew, where Jesus is born, we read quotations from the Old Testament that Matthew says, thus it fulfills it, it's fulfilled in Christ. These are things known as formula citations, formula citations. There are four formula citations in Matthew's story of the nativity. There is no problem in chapter one saying, a virgin shall conceive. Straight out of Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14, the Hebrew word Alma, the Greek word uh, Parthenos, we get Parthenogenesis, no problem. Rachel is weeping, that's straight out of the book of, of Jeremiah, no problem. Out of Egypt I called my son straight out of the book of Hosea. No problem. But he shall be called a Nazarene? There is no such verse in the Bible, he shall be called a Nazarene. Is Matthew mistaken? Is the Holy Spirit mistaken, inspiring to, to write a verse is being fulfilled by Jesus, not in the Bible? There's no verse, he shall be called a Nazarene. But there's a word play. There is a word, netzer. And in Jeremiah 23, the rabbis agree it's about the Messiah. He shall be called a Netzer. Nezer. Nezer is the word branch. The Hebrew word for Christian is Notsri. Notsri. 
Tz. Okay, the Hebrew letter is a tzaddik. Tz, no tzri. Nazarene, natzeret. Tz. Branch, nezer. You change one letter. And that letter is a tzaddik in Hebrew. Looks like a Y. It's also the Hebrew word for righteous. So the Messiah shall be a righteous branch. He shall be a notzri. Wordplay. You find this many times in the Old Testament. Secondly, we see historical selection. What people often don't realize, and what many creationists even fail to realize, is this. In the creation narrative in Genesis 1 to 3, the book of Genesis is not a comprehensive history of the creation. It is not a scientific textbook. It's not about geology, it's not about biology, it doesn't pretend to be. What it is, is the theological interpretation of the history of the creation. Now that's not to say we don't agree with its historicity. I believe in the historicity of Genesis 1 to 3 and Genesis 1 to 11. But it's not intended to be a comprehensive history of the creation. It's the theological interpretation of it. It's a polemic against paganism. Other pagan civilizations had creation myths. The Gilgamesh literature, they had stories of Noah. Other people knew about these things. The, the Egyptians had their own version of Adam and Eve. But the Jews had the historically correct understand, record of these things, and they had the theologically correct interpretation of it. Well, the Gospels are no different. The Gospels are not a comprehensive history and don't pretend to be. They are the theological interpretation of the history. At the end of his gospel, John says, if everything that Jesus did was written down, all the books couldn't contain it. That is why, for instance, in Matthew's genealogy of Jesus, why it doesn't agree with Genesis and with Chronicles. It doesn't list every ancestor and every generation. It's selective history. It only includes those ancestors of Jesus that are the who are theologically important to what Matthew's trying to say. He's trying to show Jesus as a Davidic Messiah. So he only includes those ancestors who are important. It's not trying to be historically complete. It's trying to be theologically complete in its interpretation of history. The third thing we see is gematria. We have to be careful with gematria. Hebrew letters like Roman numerals are letters. The Hebrew letters are numbers, digits. Today we have a lot of crazy people saying and doing a lot of crazy things. In mystical Judaism, Kabbalah, Zohar, we have mystical numbers and people trying to figure out all kinds of things using Kabbalah. This is based on mysticism and its origins are Gnostic, not Jewish. There's a practice in mystical Judaism called Remes, where if you know the number of a word, you can understand its meaning better. There was a book written a few years ago by basically, a, I consider him a con artist, Michael Drosden on Bible Codes. Now, some Israeli professors like Dr. Professor of Mathematics at the Technion in Haifa, uh, Eliyahu Rips, there is definitely a numer numerical pattern to scripture. Ever since the Russian mathematician Ivan Panin, Christians have been exploring the, the, the recurrent numerical patterns of scripture. There's no question as to the numerical patterns. But Drosnin was using acrostics, trying to find secret meanings and prophecies through using acrostics. Gail Ripplinger, who wrote the book on, on Bible versions, does the same thing. These things are mysticism. They're mystical. They're Gnostic. They have absolutely no exegetical foundation whatsoever. But there is something known as gematria. The 14 generations in Matthew's Gospel, number 14, the, the letters of David's name, King David's name, are 14. And because Matthew is trying to show the Messiah as a descendant of David, you have this interplay of words with mathematical values. That's known as gematria. The New Testament used this thing. Fourthly, we have midrash, from the Hebrew word daresh, to inquire into. A preacher in Hebrew is known as a drashan. It's one of the words. Kohelet is the other word, but drashan is the main word. There's a peshet and a pesher. A peshet is the simple, straightforward meaning of a text. The pesher is the deeper spiritual meaning. We see this in the Qumran in the Dead Sea Scrolls, a peshet and a pesher. 
here is the difference between Jewish hermeneutics and Gnosticism. In Gnosticism, you base a doctrine on a type, a symbol, an allegory. You use literary allegory to make up your doctrines. Okay. In Midrash, you never do that. You use symbolism, you use typology in order to illustrate doctrine. For instance, if we were to set up a Passover table here and demonstrate a Seder meal and show how the Last Supper was a Seder meal, it would illustrate the doctrine of atonement with Jesus as the lamb, with the matzah bread being striped and pierced, corresponding to his flesh, he was pierced for our transgressions, by his stripes we are healed. All of the symbolism would illustrate the doctrine, but you never base a doctrine on it. The Gnostics do. A peshet and a pesha, I'll come to that in a moment. And finally, of all things, we have liberal scholars who don't understand either Hebrew, Judaism, or Midrash, or Christianity. <laughs> People I mentioned yesterday, like Barbara Thiering and John Spong at the forefront, who are trying to use Midrash, at least their, their own particular version of it, not the actual one, in order to validate their arguments for invalidating the Bible. In other words, we shouldn't take it literally based on Midrash, when Lid Midrash does take the Bible quite literally. But let's go further. St. Paul was a rabbi educated in the school of Hillel. There was two rabbinic schools of theology in St. Paul's day the school of Shammai and the school of Hillel. St. Paul's tutor, we know from the book of Acts, was Rabbi Gamaliel, Rabbi Gamaliel. We read about him in the book of Acts chapter four. He said if Jesus was not the Messiah, Christianity wouldn't last. Well, it did last. Now we have to understand that Paul was trained in this rabbinic school. Much as Moses was trained in the wisdom of Egypt before he was trained in the wisdom of God, Moses was trained in the wisdom of the rabbis before he was, um, Paul was trained in the wisdom of the rabbis before he was trained in the wisdom of Christ. We see Paul repeatedly drawing on his rabbinic background. When God wanted to get someone to explain the purpose of the law and pointing to Christ, he didn't get a fisherman, he got a Pharisee. He drew on Paul's background. When he needed somebody who could present the gospel apologetically to the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers in Greece and Athens at the Areopagus, he got Paul. He got a Roman citizen, a Greek-speaking intellectual. He did not get a fisherman. Paul was used by God, drawing on Paul's background after it had been to the cross and been resurrected. It was now to be used for Christ's service. One thing we see in the New Testament is the second principle of Midrash. There were seven midot, seven principles, but the first two are the two most seen in the New Testament. The first one is called kal vahomer, kal vahomer, not on here, meaning light to heavy. If something is true in a light situation, it will become particularly true in a heavy situation. Now this is very important in understanding eschatology, the last days. For instance, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, forsake not the fellowshipping together one with another, especially as you see the day approaching. Fellowship is always important, but in the last days, in a heavy situation, it becomes particularly important. If you can't stand together, you'll never stand alone. Beware of Christians who chronically stay out of fellowship. I don't care if you meet in a tent if you can't find the church, but we're told in Proverbs, he who remains alone lacks sense, he quarrels against all wisdom. It's just not God's will. What's true in a light situation becomes especially true in a heavy situation in the last days. There have always been false prophets. That's the cow. But in the last days, they multiply and they infiltrate the church in bigger numbers. That's the homer, light to heavy. But the second principle is binyan ab meshte ketubim. You know, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, Peter describes the church as the temple. And he says, we are the living stones of the oikos hegios in Greek, of the, we're, of the holy house. We're the stones of the temple. When you use binyan ab meshtekhet to beam, it literally means you build an argument by comparing two texts using the same language or symbolism. On Palm Sunday, when the Lord Jesus entered the Temple Mount, the people were singing the Hallel Rabbah to him from the Passover liturgy. From Psalm 118, they were all chanting, waving palm branches, singing, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, barachnu hem mebet Adonai, 
הודו לאדוני כי טוב, כי לעולם חסדו, הושענה חושענה לבן דוד, save us son of David. That's what they were doing. Okay, so hello Rabbah. And the Sanhedrin said, tell the people to remain silent. But Jesus says, if these remain silent, the stones will cry out. Christians are the stones of the temple. What was Jesus saying? In Midrash, in Jewish metaphor, Jesus was saying, if the Jews don't proclaim me, the Christians will. You understand? John the Baptist was rebuking his fellow Jews because they thought that they were favored by God simply because they were circumcised and descendants of Abraham. They thought simply because they had Brit Milah, they were circumcised, it meant they were a cut above the rest. <laughs> but Yochanan Hamatbil, John the Baptist, he said, God could raise up Abraham's children out of the... He's talking on two levels. Okay, he's talking on two levels. The Peshet and the Pesher, but then there's the Mashal and the Nimshal. A Mashal is a description of everyday life, and the Nimshal is its spiritual interpretation. The book of Proverbs in Hebrew is called Mishle, the book of Mashals. Like a gold ring through a swine's nose, that's the Mashal, is a beautiful woman without discretion. That's the Nimshal, the interpretation of it. <coughs> A parable is simply an elongated mashal, a story that's a mashal. In Galatians chapter 4, we read Paul's allegorical interpretation of Sarah and Hagar, the two women. Nobody reading the book of Genesis using Western grammatical historical exegesis would ever arrive at St. Paul's conclusion. You'd say he was allegorizing it out of all context. But indeed, he was not. If you understand, he was using Midrash. There was a Peshet and a Pesher. Peshet comes from the Hebrew word Pashut, meaning simple, simple. But the Pesher is the interpretation of what's simple. Again, never as a basis of doctrine, that's Gnosticism, but as the illustration of it. Let me explain even further. Midrash is not only a matter, method of hermeneutics, it's a literary genre in Hebrew. The clearest example of Midrash as a literary genre in the New Testament is Jude's epistle. Ha'igeret Yehuda, the epistle of Jude. You see how he describes backsliders in the church. Waterless clouds. We're told as clouds of witnesses, but they're void of the water. They're twice dead. They're backslidden. Lit Midrash is an allegorical form of literature. If a Jewish Christian in the first century were to read Genesis 1, 2, and 3, he would say it's the creation narrative just as we would. But if that same Jewish Christian, that same Messianic Jew, if you prefer the term, in the first century, read John 1, 2, and 3, which he would have called Abisara bel pe Yochanan, he would have said John chapter 1, John chapter 2, and John chapter 3 is the story of the new creation. And this John 1, 2, and 3, the Gospel of John, is a midrash on Genesis. The creation story in Genesis is the peshet, but the peshet is fulfilled in Christ. In other words, he would have said, God walked in the garden, God walked the earth, Adam heard God walking in the garden. Well, God walked the earth in the creation in Genesis, now God walks the earth in the new creation in John. In the creation in Genesis, the spirit moved on the face of the water and brought forth the creation. In John, born of water and of spirit, spirit moves on the water and brings forth the new creation. He would have said, in the creation in Genesis, you have the light and the dark, the great light and the little light, first of all, the moon, the sun, the little light and the great light, but in the new creation, we have Yochanan HaMatbil and Yeshua HaMashiach. John the Baptist, the little light, and Jesus, the great light. He would have said, well, God separates the light from dark in the creation in Genesis. And now, an archaic kaiho logos, in the beginning was the word. Same as the Septuagint of Genesis 1, an archaic in the beginning. 
God separates the light from dark in the creation in Genesis. Now he separates the light from dark in the new creation in John. The darkness does not overcome it or comprehend it. He would have went on. God began his plan for man with a marital union in the creation. So Jesus in John chapter 2 verse 1, he begins his new plan for man at the wedding at Cana, at a marital union. He would have said, John chapter 2, verse 1, it's the third day. And on the third day, God does a creative miracle with water in the book of Genesis. But now Jesus, on the third day, it says in Cana, he does a miracle with water. One is a midrash on the other. In the body of Jewish literature, the tree of life, Eitz Haim, in Ezekiel 47, in the book of Revelation, going back to Genesis, the tree of life, the Eitz Haim, is represented by a fig tree. When people talk about the parable of the fig tree in the book of, of Matthew, in Matthew 24 and in Luke, Luke 21, it's much more than Israel. It's much more. The parable of the fig tree goes back to the book of Judges, it's the fig tree and the other trees. Nonetheless, the fig tree represents the tree of life, the Eitz Hayim. Now the Peshet is, the Peshet, Nathaniel, not Taniel, says to Yeshua, Jesus, how did you know? Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree. The peshet, the simple meaning is, he saw him under a literal fig tree up on the, up on the street corner or whatever. But the pesher is, I saw you from the garden, from the creation, from the foundation of the world. I'm not a Calvinist, but those whom he predestined, those whom he foreknew from the foundation of the world. He was telling Nathaniel something much more than I saw you under a literal fig tree. That was the peshet. He was giving him the pesher. I knew you from the creation. The entire story is a story of creation and new creation. This is another gap in the theology of my fellow creationists or those who believe in creationism. Uh, there is more to the creation than creation. It is the harbinger of new creation when you understand midrashically the relationship between John and Genesis. This theme continues throughout the Gospel. In John 8 we have the background of the Hebrew feast Simchat Torah, Simchat Torah. John is the most festal of the Jewish Gospels and Jesus is always fulfilling the feast in some way. The woman caught in adultery in John 8, although some manuscripts omit the verse, I believe it is canonical, was found in adultery. That's one of the Ten Commandments. The entire Bible was written by God inspiring men, except the Decalogue, except the Ten Commandments. That was written by God's own finger, you understand. To this day, when a rabbi reads the Torah, he takes what we call ha etzba bazel, the brass finger, and points to the Torah scroll as he reads it, showing it's God's word, not man's. Okay. God wrote the Decalogue, including thou shalt not commit adultery. The reason it says that he wrote with his finger, it was showing that that same God who gave the law and ordained marriage is now the same God giving a new commandment based on grace and forgiveness. Okay, that's why. The woman had to be stoned to death. Capital execution was normally by stoning because what we read in Corinthians, using binyan ab mishtekat uh, bim, the law was the law of death engraved on stones. Therefore, the Jews had to stone people to death because the law shows us we're condemned. It's grace that shows us we can be forgiven. The purpose of the law was to show us we're condemned and can't save ourselves. That's why the Jews stoned people to death. It was a midrashic illustration of the law showing us we're condemned. But that same God who wrote the law on the stone was now writing grace. Okay. Now, there's more to this. We have tapes explaining it. John chapter 7, the Feast of Tabernacles. Again, a messianic prelude to the coming millennial reign of Jesus. It's perfectly logical on the Mount of Transfiguration, where the Nephilim came down, according to the rabbinic literature, the story of the Nephilim, it happened where Jesus went up, okay? It happened where Jesus went up. Prior to it being Caesarea Philippe, the pagan site it was in Jesus' day, the Mount of Transfiguration, it was a site of pan worship among the Greeks. And the Greek priests would have surrogate sex with their gods by having bestiality. They, 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 would, they would copulate with animals as part of their demonic worship. That was always the center of this idea of perverse sex and perverse regeneration in, in, in what it, where, where it was geographically. 
That's what the Seleucid Greeks did there. It's what happened when the Nephilim came down there, and it's a reason Jesus went up there. Peter wants to build three booths. He sees Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu. He says he sees Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet. And Peter says, let me build three booths. Peter thought that was the millennium. You understand? In Zechariah chapter 14, we see that the nations will celebrate the Feast of Booths when Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom. He thought it was the millennial reign of Christ. It was perfectly logical what he wanted to do, if you understand the Jewish background. But you had a man who never died, who was raptured, Elijah. You had a man who died faithful to the Lord, Moses. And you had Jesus. That's the clearest picture we have in the Bible of the rapture and resurrection. We meet the Lord in the air, up on top of this mountain, illustrating it. Yeah, it's the clearest picture. It doesn't matter if you're dead in Christ when he comes or if you were alive in Christ when he comes. We'll meet him in the air and we shall be as he is. It's the closest picture we have of what will happen when the Lord comes back and we meet him in the air. But to understand these things, you have to go back to understand the scriptures as Jewish literature. And what a theologian would call its sitzimleben, its own life situation. Many examples of, of Binyan Ab Meshtek uh, we have a number of tapes explaining it, but if a Jewish Christian were trying to understand eschatology, the last days in the first century, in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, seal these things up to the appointed time. There is no new revelation. But there is a new understanding of what's already in the Bible. Okay? The faithful will understand end time events through the scriptures by the power of the Holy Ghost, but they're sealed up. There are things now that are becoming clearer to us that would not have made sense a generation ago. There are current events in the Middle East fulfilling prophecy that at one time would have made little of any sense. The fact that these things are becoming clearer shows these things are being unsealed. But we will never interpret the book of Revelation or the book of Daniel or the book of Ezekiel by trying to interpret it with a Western hermeneutic, by looking at it as Protestant literature. We have to go back to understanding these things as ancient Hebrew literature. Not the rabbinic corruption. Rabbinic Judaism is a total corruption of the Torah. The Jewish faith as you see it now rejects its Messiah and it's a false religion. It's as much a false Judaism as liberal Protestantism or Roman Catholicism or false Christianities. They're nothing, it's nothing to do with what Moses taught. But the Second Temple period Judaism of the time of Jesus, in which the apostles wrote, we see the scriptures differently. If this same Jewish Christian were reading the book of Revelation, and he began reading about the seven seals and the seven bowls, and when you break the seventh seal, then seven trumpets come out. And then you have silence in heaven for a half hour. And then you have these two witnesses. And then they blow the last trumpet and it says, this world has become the kingdom of our God and his Messiah. See, a Jewish Christian in the first century would have said, that's a midrash on the book of Joshua, chapter 6. Seven sevens, but from the seventh seven is a numerical subset of seven. Well, you break the seventh seal, then the seven trumpets come out. They marched around Jericho seven days, but the seventh day they had to do it seven times. Okay. Two witnesses. Hey, there was two spies rescuing the Gentile women. The rapture of the church somehow it relates to that. Okay. They had to be totally silent when they marched around Jericho. I heard silence in heaven for a half hour. That's an amazing thing in itself. We have two Greek words for time. We have kairos and we have chronos. How do you apply time to eternity? Big question, but let's go further. <laughs> when they blow the last trumpet, this city has been given to us by our God. Revelation, you blow the last trumpet, this world has become the kingdom of our God and his Messiah. You will never interpret the book of Revelation using Western grammatical historical exegesis alone. You cannot serve a quadratic equation using arithmetic. You can't solve differential equations or elegantly solved equations by counting on your fingers. You have to be able to do arithmetic to be able to do a quadratic equation or a second order differential equation, but you're never going to solve the equation counting on your fingers. Neither will we understand the mysteries of the end times by trying to read the Bible as Western literature alone. 
Let's understand how the church got away from its Hebrew root and began to misunderstand the scriptures. I'm not saying that people did not understand the gospel or basic truth, but remember the church at Ephesus was the only church that had a lamp in its lampstand. Thy word is the lamp to my feet. They understood things because of the apostles that others did not. Paul says, don't boast against the natural branches in Romans 11. If the church forgets its Hebrew root, it will begin to forget where it came from and it won't properly understand where it's going. Paul tells us, and that was affirmed by a number of people throughout church history, including one of my favorite Bible expositors, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, agreed. Nonetheless, let's look. In the early church, two schools of theology came into play. The bad one was the Alexandrian school. These people began not using midrash, not using symbolism and typology and allegory to illustrate doctrine, but they based doctrine on it. The stage was already set by someone called Philo. He was half Jewish, and he began actually mixing the literary forms of Greek Gnosticism with Jewish scriptures. And of course, because the Septuagint came into Greek, the stage was set for this to happen. Later on, Clement of Alexandria began playing with the same ideas of mystical interpretation. His protege was Oregon. These people arrived at absurd conclusions. Oregon said the devil would be saved. Oregon emasculated himself, all based on wrong doctrine. The other school was the Antiochian school associated with the Cappadocian fathers. These people were initially somewhat better. They also went away from the Hebrew root of the faith in many respects, certainly culturally, and many became anti-Semitic. Later on in the East, John Chrysostom was a vehement anti-Semite. But they did not go into mysticism to the same degree as the Alexandrians. So now, the original Hebrew hermeneutics used by Matthew and Paul and Jesus have disappeared. Now you only have the Antiochian school and the Alexandrian school in the patristic literature. And you wind up with problems. Augustine of Hippo began taking these ideas of Alexandria and bringing them to the West, to the Latin-speaking West. Augustine is the author of many wrong things in the church. Post-millennialism, amillennialism, celibacy, ecclesiastical violence, certainly, and infant baptism, all are indebted to the errors introduced by Augustine. Because he refuted Pelagianism, because he upheld that man has fallen and had original sin, he's seen as a good guy. And on that point, he was certainly right. But strangely, both Protestantism and Catholicism both draw on Augustine. The real root of both Protestantism in the Reformation sense and Catholicism is Augustine. That was the fault of the Reformers. Instead of going back to the New Testament, they went back to what Augustine said about the New Testament. Now, there were Christians who did not do that. They were called the Baptists at that time, Anabaptists. But the Protestants persecuted it. Most people don't think of this, but if you are brethren, or you are Baptist, or you are Pentecostal, during the Reformation, you would not have been seen as a Protestant. You would have been seen as an Anabaptist, and you would have been persecuted by Protestants and Catholics in most cases. Okay. He would allegorize things. Well, the Good Samaritan, let's see. Well, that's St. Paul. And you bring it to the inn, the injured man, that's the church. And of course, the law can't save. That's why the priest and the Levite came. Well, so far, it makes sense. But then they begin saying all kinds of other things. Well, the two coins of grace and truth or something like this, and they, 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 they would try to assign some arbitrary, mystically revealed meaning to every detail of the narrative. This evolved into something terrible, the census plenier, the fuller sense of scripture which in the year 1854, <laughs> when the Pope spoke from the chair of Peter, his census plenty of interpretations were declared to be infallible. He cannot make a mistake. These popes have been everything from warlords to closet queens, but of course they're infallible. Now as we talked about yesterday, these things evolved. 
Plato rewrote Christendom as a Platonic religion. He rewrote Christendom as a Platonic religion. Later on, Thomas Aquinas, after the Renaissance, wrote, rewrote Christ Christendom as a Aristotelian religion. The census plenier. They'd arrive at conclusions like the 70 years when the Pope was forced out of Italy for political reasons and took refuge in Avignon, France. That's the Babylonian captivity. Those are, that, that's, how far they, that's how far they would go with this allegorization. As we looked at yesterday, the reaction to this was Christian humanism. Erasmus inspired Luther. Luther and others like Pharrell and, uh, and Busser inspired Calvin. And they went back to looking at the Bible purely as history and literature that was inspired, looking at the plain meaning. What happens here when you go back to this stoic, plain meaning? Well, something good happens, but what happens is not good enough you go part the way back to the New Testament. The reformers did not restore biblical Christianity in many ways. They continued with the state church, which was brought about by Augustine and Constantine, known as Erastianism. They continued with infant baptism, the idea that the church could use violence to convert people because God knocked St. Paul off the horse. That's what Augustine taught. And the Crusades came from all this. The reformers continued to believe and practice those things and did some terrible things. But neither did they go back to biblical Christianity fully in the area of hermeneutics in their interpretation of the Bible. They were absolutely right about the corruption of the, parasy, uh, of the, of the papacy. They were absolutely right about what they said ab about justification by, by grace, uh, by faith, salvation by grace. They were absolutely right what they said about the authority of Scripture. But sprinkling babies and Erastianism and a church state and the use of violence by the church, these things were wrong. These things came from Catholicism, not the Bible. So they looked at the Bible as literature. John Calvin, before he wrote any Christian literature as such, as he, before he wrote his destitutes or institutes, John Calvin wrote a commentary on Seneca's De Clementia, classic Latin literature. The same methods of hermeneutics, of literary and historical interpretation John Calvin used to analyze secular literature is the approach he took to the Bible. Now, that got rid of a lot of the myths and errors of medieval Catholicism, the census plenia. He did that. But he only went back so far. Later on, the first ones to realize this were the Puritans. The Puritans were people who said the Reformation, particularly in England, didn't go back far enough. They also made many mistakes, but one of the Puritans was John Lightfoot. Lightfoot wrote a commentary using Jewish Midrash on the New Testament. And he did that in the 1600s. The man was centuries ahead of his time. John Robinson, who was the chaplain to the Pilgrim Fathers who came on the Mayflower to America, he said the same thing. There's more light in this that we don't understand yet. We have to go further into it. And the Puritans made the first headway into going back to try to understand the Bible as Jewish literature, to their credit, despite their mistakes. In grammatical historical exegesis, you have the conservative evangelicals. These came from the Christian humanism of Erasmus, Luther, and Calvin. We simply analyze the Bible as history and literature to understand its meaning. But then there are, as we looked at yesterday, the higher critical liberal scholars who simply say, well, we use grammatical historical exegesis, but it's not inspired. It's only literature and history. That's all. That's what they say. And embellished history and fabricated literature. Okay. So you've got two approaches in Protestant hermeneutics that came from the Reformation. The conservative who analyzed the Bible as literature and history, who believe it's God's word, and the ones who don't. Now, obviously, we'd be closer to the first group. They at least believe it's the word of God. The epistles are letters. The epistles are the prism through which we read other scripture. You don't have to understand Midrash to read the epistles. You can understand the epistles largely, certainly the Pauline epistles, just using grammatical historical exegesis. The epistles are commentary on other scripture. They're inspired commentary. 
If you want to know what the book of Leviticus means, we'll begin by reading Hebrews. If you want to know what the Torah means, read Romans and Galatians. It's commentary on other scripture. And you don't need to understand Midrash to understand the epistles. It'll give you all the basic doctrines, it'll give you the gospel. But the epistles themselves repeatedly used Jewish exegesis, Jewish hermeneutics to arrive at those truths. Look at Galatians, look at Peter, look at Jude. But now we have neo-Gnosticism. Two things are happening here. The prophet Daniel was told the following, seal these things up once more, seal these things up until the time of the end. Revelation, Ezekiel, Daniel, these things are sealed. The devil always counterfeits. There are mysteries in the Bible. We have the mystery of Christ in the New Testament, but that's contrasted to the mystery of iniquity. This is here about mysteries. It means Gnosticism. It means allegorization. And people react vehemently, including people who are otherwise good, the good, good writers, like uh, Dr. Walter Kaiser, people who I otherwise would like. They're trying to defend orthodoxy so much against people who would deviate from it that they go down the road of the old Antiochian school because they're trying to react against the Alexandrian school to this very day. Okay. Is that the solution? Well, no, it isn't. But let's go further. Let's look at how neo-Gnosticism has influenced the church. Let's look at Calvinists, first of all. Calvinists would affirm themselves to be dogmatically anti-mystical, anti-Gnostic, dogmatically orthodox. They would affirm it. I mean true Calvinists here. Yet, Calvinism has its own brand of Gnosticism, known as supersessionism, replacement theology. Most of the errors in popular charismatic or charismania and charismatic and hyper-Pentecostal heresy, and I am a Pentecostal, moderately speaking, <laughs> do not have their origins among charismatics. Charismatics don't know the Bible well enough to corrupt it to begin with. <laughs> Most of the errors in today's church originate, I mean among charismatics and Pentecostals, it goes back to the neo-Gnosticism of the Reformed. Let's begin. Well, the church is Israel now. God's finished with the Jews. Reformed theology, covenant theology, says the church is now Israel. Therefore, because Israel was a theocratic state with a land that had to set up a government that was ruled by its religion, we have to do the same thing. Calvin did this in Geneva. Zwingli did this in Zurich. John Knox tried to do it in Scotland. We make a church state just like Israel, forget about the fact that Jesus said his kingdom was not of this world and he would not become involved with the political issues as such, only the moral issues. No, we have to reconstruct society. Now today you have kingdom now, triumphalists, dominionists, people in the restoration movement in this country like Roger Forster, Gerald Coates, Bryn Jones. Do you know where they get their eschatology, their doctrine? Not from charismatics or Pentecostals, they get it from the neo-Gnosticism of Calvinism. They get it from people like Rousus Rush Dooney, Gary North, David Shilton, Greg Bonson. They get it from these hyper-Calvinistic reconstructionists. That's where they get their eschatology. Because the charismatic movement is by and large so experiential, it has no theology of its own. It has to get it somewhere else. And so they go get it from the Gnosticism of extreme Calvinists. Well, the church is Israel, and the Jews had to circumcise babies on the eighth day. Now we'll sprinkle babies. Many of them do it on the eighth day. They make baptism the equivalent of circumcision. Erastianism, the state church. Post-millennialism. Every time they see something that, that, that would point to millennium, if you understand it in light of Revelation chapter 20, they spiritualize it. They just spiritualize the text. It cannot be literal. 
This can't be a thousand years. Well, if the three and a half years is literal, why isn't the thousand years literal? Why are the years literal in one place but not in another place? They have no objective exegetical basis, simply a subjective claim to it. This is Gnostic. Gnostic. Well, where does the Bible say the church is Israel? But they go beyond this. Calvinism in its pure form, I don't, I don't even believe that Calvin was a Calvinist. <laughs> they teach covenant theology. That God only made two covenants, one with Adam and one with Abraham. The New Testament becomes demeaned because the church is now Israel. The New Covenant predicted, prophesied in Jeremiah 31, 31, and Israel, I'll make a new covenant, cut a new covenant with the house of Israel, house of Judah, not like the one I made with their fathers. Well, we shouldn't emphasize that passage too much. Or when Jesus said, I'll give you the new cup of the new covenant, my blood. Yes, that's true, but that's only part of the one with Abraham. You've got to understand something's wrong here. To say God only made two covenants, one with Adam and one with Abraham, there's a great danger in becoming too dispensational if you're concerned with those issues. But covenant theology is just not plausible. It has, there's not one verse in the Bible that would say that God made two covenants. It all comes from this neo-Gnosticism, the church is Israel. There is nothing in the exegetical context of the Bible that would say the church is Israel. There was nothing that would give you a license to, to allegorize years in one place but take them literally in another within the same book. Nothing. But they just do it. This is Gnostic. The whole faith prosperity teaching that you see with the hyper-Pentecostal people manipulating the, the poor and unemployed, the TV preachers. Do you know how slavery was justified in the American South? The Calvinistic understanding of election. We're favored. It's right for us to do this. The plantation period in Northern Ireland was the same thing. We're the chosen. We're the elect. We can... This idea of using wealth as the proof of your blessing and election, that wasn't invented by Kenneth Copeland or Kenneth Hagin. They're not clever enough. It was invented by Calvinists. Most of these things, dominionism, kingdom now theology, they have their roots in the neo-Gnosticism of Reformed Protestantism. Now, again, I'm not saying that the Reformed Church has not said and done good things. I'm simply saying there is a problem. The liberals are, of course, much worse. They have liberation theology. They use a hermeneutic called conscientiousization. In other words, instead of opening the Bible and using the Bible as the premise to address an issue, you begin with the issue and address the Bible. You make the Bible say what you want it to say. First, you get a belief in response to your need or your perceived need, and then you simply give the Bible a new meaning as a proof text. Liberation theologians will say the central event in the Bible in salvation history, Heilsgeschichte, is not the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's rather the exodus because it was a political liberation. <laughs> now these are some so-called Christians. The neo-Gnosticism of liberal Protestantism is almost unbelievable. Yet they would claim to be scientific, grammatical, historical exegetes. You assign your own meaning based on some subjective basis. But then we have something now that's even more serious. In no way am I anti-reformed people, and in no way am I anti-charismatic or anti-Pentecostal. I have brothers in Christ who are in reformed churches, and I appreciate the good things the reformed people have done. I'm quick to point out the virtues of the Puritans as well as their mistakes. I'm quick to point out the virtues of the Reformers as well as their mistakes. And I'm quick to point out the virtues of the more biblical Pentecostals and Charismatics as opposed to the maniacs running around today. But we have a problem. Neo-Gnosticism. Once more, in the early church, you had two versions. You had the purely pagan version or versions and the form that got into the church. Today, it's the same. The pagan version is the New Age movement. The form getting into the church, restorationism. Uh, the things believed by the restoration movement, the things that you saw coming out of Toronto and Pensacola, 
They have no biblical basis for these things. Only the Lord showed me. Now let me explain this. Whenever you speak to a Gnostic, you're going to have the following problem. Here's the problem. They will use the same terms you and I do, but mean something entirely different by them. I go to Hawaii, which is a, Maui is a mecca for New Ages. In Scotland, it's a place called Finhorn. They just come there from all over and hang out and do their thing. When you witness to a New Ager, and they, they stand on the beach totally naked, covered with tattoos, chanting at the sun. Hundreds of them. I told someone yesterday, I had a young woman a few months ago in Hawaii, came up to me totally naked with a hash pipe. She said, you want some? And I said, if I wasn't a Christian, I'd take you and the pipe, but I got something better now. <laughs> When you witness to a New Ager, this is what will happen in the dialogue. You'll tell the New Ager, I've been born again, and I saw the light, say. You'll use the evangelical cliches. I saw the light, and I was born again. The New Ager will tell you, I saw the light, and I was born again. Only to you, the light is the true light, the Lord Jesus. To them, the light is they came to the awareness of the cosmic illumination of the inner self. And they were reborn. You tell them you believe in sin. They believe in sin. Only to you it's transgression against God. To them it's giving place to negative energy, <laughs> negative vibes. They will use the same terms you use and mean something different by them. In the ecumenical dialogue between Catholics and Protestants, you'll find the same phenomena. The Jesuit will say one thing and the Protestant, so-called, will say another. The Protestant will say, we're saved by grace, justified by faith. And the Jesuit will say, yes, we're saved by grace, we're justified by faith. Oh, the Reformation was a mistake. Let's shake hands and sign an agreement like J.I. Packer did. Only the Catholic has a different definition of grace. The Protestant is thinking the Hebrew word chesed, God's mercy in the covenant. He's thinking of the Greek word charism gift. He's thinking of the Oxford Dictionary's definition, undeserved or unmerited favor. To the Catholic, grace is an ethereal substance earned by sacraments, <laughs> administered by priests. Salvation is not from the Lord, but from an institution. It's ritualistic regeneration. Sac it's known as ex opere operato sacramentalism. Well, they both agree we're saved by grace, but there's two entirely different definitions of grace. Now, this has gotten into the church. When you see people who are into the laughing thing, or into the restoration movement, or into the, the, the money, the, the faith prosperity, when they use words like revival, they mean something entirely different than you do. When they use words like victory, they mean something entirely different than the scripture does. When they sing, God has an army marching on the land, they mean something very different than the Bible means by those ideas. They will use the same terms, the same jargon, but they'll have a different meaning. Whenever you deal with a Gnostic, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, when they come to your door or a Mormon, they'll use biblical terms, but they will mean something different by them. Every form of Gnosticism has that problem. They use the same terms we do, but with a different definition. You've got to be very careful in defining your terms. But it's not just with New Agers, or with the Mormons knocking on the door, or with the Roman Church. Now you have to define your terms when you speak to people in the vineyard movement. When the Kansas City prophets came over here at the behest of the late John Wimber, their whole premise was Joel's army. They were going to give an exegetical justification to the Old Manifest Sons Latter-day Reign ideas that were rejected by popular Pentecostalism in the 40s and 50s. Now it's going to, this whole thing going back to William Brannan and so forth, and, and Kenyon, and th these things are becoming mainstream now, and they're looking for a biblical basis. And they actually found a theologian formerly of Dallas Seminary, John Deere, Jack Deere, to, to, to give them a basis to this. Of course, John Wimber went with it, and Mike Bickle went with it. 
And they said, well, we're Joel's army. Now, if you look at the book of Joel, the first thing Joel says in chapter 1, verse 4, is the wakey drunkards. Joel says, sober up. Rodney Howard Brown was saying, drinking at Joel's place. <laughs> it doesn't matter what Joel says. It only matters what the Gnostic says about what Joel says. You understand? God showed me. This is a blessing. Joel's army was originally Nebuchadnezzar's forthcoming invasion. Okay? There were multiple invasions, each invasion getting worse. Finally, it's the locusts doing the devouring. Okay? Now, the book of Revelation draws on this and says it will be recapitulated eschatologically. In other words, what happened with Nebuchadnezzar's invasions, with the rise of Babylon, you see Babylon the Great in Revelation again. And those insects in the book of Joel, we find them again in the book of Revelation. One is the picture of the other, of what's going to come. So these are demon armies of Antichrist. In their own day, the Nebuchadnezzar's army, the Babylonian Empire. John Wimber, Jack Deere, these people pushing the manifest son's man-child, they said, that's us. That's the triumphant church going forth in victory. And they'll actually sing choruses and get you singing them that will sound something like, ah, they run on the city, they run on the walls, great is the army who can. They're singing about the Antichrist army. They're singing about demon cohorts in Revelation. They're singing about the Babylonians, and they think it's about them. The way Gnosticism works today, people become absorbed, seduced into the false theology of it by singing choruses. You understand? It's emotive. It's emotional manipulation. What you have today in much of the church is the worship of worship, not the worship of God. It is really entertainment. It is not biblically based. So when Nassos comes in, God has shown me this. We're, we're the armies that are going to do the devouring. We're the locusts, says Paul Cain. We're the locusts, says John Wimber. We're the locusts, says Mike Pickle, the Kansas City guy. And in this country, the whole crowd that gave, gave you Alpha in Toronto, the, 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 the Holy Trinity prompt, and they were all clapping and cheering, thinking that they're the locusts. Now, when you go to chapter 2, verse 21, what happens to this great army? I will cast it into the Western Sea, and its stench will go up to heaven. You want to be part of an army God's going to judge and destroy? Join the Vineyard Movement or go to Holy Trinity Brompton. <laughs> that's what it comes to. But that's what they think. How do they arrive at this? Simple. Gnosticism. God has shown me. <laughs> now, how does this relate to evolution? As we talked at yesterday, the shift in science results in shifts in technology, economy, and worldview. Now we have the paradigm shift. Postmodernism, as we looked at yesterday. Everything becomes relative. It's not what the text says, it's what it means for you. The objective becomes usurped by the subjective, Gnostic, a mystical revelation. This is what it means to me. The Bible tells us that there are people in the body of Christ with the gift of teaching. Look at how many home groups will meet in a home group and they'll read a passage and they'll pray maybe and read a passage and each person will share what it means to them. <laughs> Objective meaning becomes systematically eroded. Now I'm not against people sharing how God may have worked in their life or spoke to them through a text, but first you have to do justice to what the text means in its context. So we're left today with two challenges and two errors. One we're left with the old error, the reformers not going far enough. We're left with the Antiochian school. We're left with people who are so afraid of mystical interpretation, allegorical interpretation, people who are so afraid of it, they throw the baby out with the bathwater. The Pesha is forgotten, we only keep the Peshat. That is fine for your day-to-day -day life, but you're never going to interpret the book of Revelation with the Peshat. It's too complicated to be Pashut, to be simple. You have to understand the Pesha. This is what it means, these things will be unsealed. Is there hidden meaning in the Bible? That's what Revelation means, apocalypsis. It's going to be lifted up. 
its veil. It will be lifted up. Now, this relates in part to Romans chapter 11, when the natural branches are grafted back in again. There is a reason not only that the Jews are back in Israel, but that Jews are being saved again in big numbers, and why more and more Christians are coming to the awareness that God has a prophetic purpose not only for the Jews, but we have to understand Christianity and its Jewish origins. Now, there are corruptions of this, like the Hebrew root movement, and there's extreme access to the Messianic movement. There are crazy people lifting up Jewishness instead of Jesusness. I know all that. But the devil will always try to counterfeit something that's true. The apostles were Jews. They wrote something called the Brit Hadashah. Paul was a rabbi, Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus. Jesus was Rabbi Yeshua Bar Yosef bin Etzeret. They wrote their literature in the literary genre and in the style of the culture in which they were writing to the people to whom they were writing. I cannot understand the way the New Testament handles the old with a Protestant mentality. Out of Egypt I called my son when Jesus comes out of Egypt? Hosea 11.1 1. If I were to read Hosea 11.1 1 with a Protestant worldview, I would say that's about the Exodus, and it is. How can he say it's about Jesus? He's allegorizing it. Coming out of Egypt is the Peshit. Applying it to Jesus is the if I look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, if I look at the Qumran literature, I have no problem with the way the New Testament handles the Old Testament. It's simply Midrash. It's what the other Jewish literature of the day did. The liberals like Michael Goulder and James Barr, who tried to discredit the New Testament by saying, look at the unscientific way it handles the Old, I just point them to Qumran, to the Dead Sea Scrolls, and say, no, you've got the problem. They're just doing what the other Jews of the day did. But it also becomes a problem for my fellow brethren in Christ, people keen to uphold orthodoxy and defend the truth. But they're defending the truth by going back to the Reformation. You don't defend a first century document with a 16th century mentality. You defend it with a 21st century mentality, and you understand the first century mentality. And then, of course, we're confronted with a much worse error. This one. Satan nearly destroyed the early church with Gnosticism. There were pre nicene fathers like Irenaeus that strove mightily and nobly to defend the church against it. But it's back today, and it's back big time. But we've also forgotten this. For all their mistakes, remember this. Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, every one of the reformers, every single one of them was a Roman Catholic priest who got saved. Every one of them was a Roman Catholic priest who read the Bible and realized it was a false Christianity. Every one of them. They were not Protestants, they were Catholics. And not only were they Catholic priests, they were from the intelligentsia of the Catholic clergy. They were humanist scholars. The ecumenical movement. This quest for common ground to understand between Protestants and Catholics, what's being championed by people like Chuck Colson, Pat Robinson, George Carey, J.I. Packer. These things are a betrayal, not only of the Reformation, but of the very principles of the gospel the Reformation tried to restore. We have a sellout here. How is it working? Gnosticism. They're using the same language we do. Roman Catholic scholars, particularly Jesuits, know how to use grammatical historical methods of lingo. If you read their scholars like Fitzmaier and Brown, you wouldn't know that they were Catholic unless you read between the lines very carefully, they know how to make it sound just like it's mainstream evangelical Protestant in what they're writing. But they mean a different thing by the terms. So you've got the Gnosticism, and the Roman Church is based on Gnosticism, census plenia, and you have the Neo-Gnosticism among my fellow Charismatics and Pentecostals. We have a problem, friends. We forgot from the Reformation but we've also forgotten something more fundamental. 
We forgot where we came from. What does Paul tell us in the book of Romans, chapter 11? The root supports you. My family, my wife, my children are Israeli. Believe me, there's nothing special about Jews. Nothing. There's only two kinds of people in the world, the ones who need to get saved and the ones who are saved. That's all. You're either saved or you need to get saved. It's nothing to do with race. There's nothing special about Jews as individuals. But there's something very special about the God of the Jews, the book of the Jews, the Messiah of the Jews, and the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews. The first coming of Christ depended on the purposes of God for Israel. And the second coming of Christ will depend on the prophetic purposes of God for Israel. And that will include hermeneutics. We have to go back and understand the New Testament, the Brit HaDashah, as Jewish literature. The solution is not to remain entrapped in the hermeneutics of the 16th century. We don't reject it, we just say it didn't go far enough. You don't serve an equation with arithmetic. But the solution is not to be stagnated in the 16th century or go back to the Reformation. I don't want to go back to the 16th century. To understand the word of God, I want to go back to the century in which it was written. I want to go back to the first century. We're in a crisis. It's not Darwinism anymore, it's neo-Darwinism. It's not a secular society, it's a post-secular society. The challenge is no longer modernism, but post-modernism. The threat today is no longer a stoic, humanistic, scientific worldview, but a new scientific worldview where science becomes remarried to the occult. Those are the threats. Those are the challenges. These are without doubt the last days and Jesus is coming. I don't know how long we have before he comes, but I know this. Before he comes, the apocalypsis will happen. That veil will be removed. These mysteries will be understood by the faithful. The solution is not to be a Protestant or a Catholic. The solution is not to be an Alexandrian or an Antiochian. The solution is to go back to the first century church, to read the Bible as Judeo-Christian literature. I don't want to be a Gnostic like John Wimber. And frankly, I don't want to be a conservative Protestant Reformed scholar. Neither one of them are going to bring me to the truth. What's going to bring me to the truth is studying in my favorite yeshiva, sitting at the feet of my favorite rabbi. His name is Rabbi Yeshua Bar Yosef, Minet Seret, Jesus of Nazareth.